My name is San Jacob Tai, I'm a cardiologist in York. Today's video is on the subject of stents, bypasses or pills for angina. What is the best treatment? Okay, a 52-year-old businessman recently came to see me in clinic. His background was that he was slim, fit, a non-smoker, but he had been understandably under lots of stress running his business and he also had a family history of heart disease with his father dying at the same age as he was now uh, with a sudden heart attack. My patient enjoyed running. He would regularly run over 10 kilometers every weekend. But over the past six months, he had noticed that whilst running, he would develop a progressive discomfort or pressure over his chest, not a pain, but a pressure. Um, and this would get worse as he continued to run and therefore would make him stop and when he would stop the discomfort would slowly improve and if he ran again to the same level he would notice the discomfort again. So he immediately booked in to see his general practitioner who then referred him to his local rapid access chest pain clinic. This is a clinic that is um, available uh, that has been organized by most NHS trusts to allow people with chest pain to be seen quickly. So he attended this and here he saw a specialist nurse who told him that she was very suspicious that he was developing angina. So she started him on some medications, which included aspirin, a beta blocker, some nitrolingual spray and a statin. She also booked him for a CT scan of his heart. Now, the CT scan is a non-invasive way to visualize the heart artery. So if you have any major narrowings, you can see them. So... My patient took those medications and then he went back to see the nurse to get the results. And she asked him how he was doing and my patient replied that since starting on the medications he was much better and his symptoms had resolved. So he was able to run now and he didn't get the chest discomfort but he was running after taking the medications. So the nurse then gave him the results of the CT scan and he was horrified to find that his CT scan had shown that he had 70 to 80 percent narrowings in the middle of all three of his heart arteries. He was even more distressed to hear from the nurse that as all his symptoms had resolved, nothing else was needed other than adherence to the tablets and the adoption of good lifestyle choices. And she said that because he was asymptomatic, she was going to discharge him with the advice that if his angina, if his chest discomfort came back, then he should be re-referred. A few weeks later, this patient contacted me. He was very worried. He said, Dr. Gupta, I've been told that I have these narrowings in my heart arteries and yet no one wants to do anything about them. Surely they should be putting in stents or even thinking about fixing me with an operation. At this point, I feel like I'm sitting on a time bomb. Even though I have no symptoms, I still feel very anxious about my future. Please help me make sense of all of this. So today I'm going to talk about what I explained to him. I always, whenever I'm faced with any kind of clinical dilemma, start off with the same lines, which I'm sure most of you who know me have already heard before. There are only two things that matter in life. Length of life, i.e. quantity of life, and quality of life. Now, coronary artery disease, heart artery narrowings, can affect both adversely. Coronary artery disease can affect quality of life by causing symptoms of angina, chest discomfort and exertion, and this may result in the need to take more tablets, increased hospitalizations, higher insurance premiums, etc. But angina can also affect length of life by causing heart attacks and even death. Now, quality of life can be measured by the patient and only by the patient. And to a large extent, the gentleman in front of me was telling me that his quality of life had been substantially improved by the medications that had been prescribed. He did not, he did have to take more tablets, but he did not feel that this was a huge burden to his quality of life. The issue therefore for him was more about what happened to his future 
and whether the decision made by the nurse was the right one for his future. It was a length of life issue that he was consulting me about, not a quality of life issue. Would it not be that if these narrowings were left unchecked, they could ultimately block off altogether and cause a large and potentially fatal heart attack? Now, the problem with working out what the best decision is for length of life purposes is that we can only base our decision making on data from research. There is no way of knowing what the best thing to do for a patient's future is without having data from studies that have studied patients just like that patient and compared different treatment strategies. This is where data from a clinical study called the ischemia trial could be useful to help our decision making process. Now, today I'm going to talk to you about the ischemia trial. The ischemia trial refers to a landmark clinical trial formerly known as the International Study of Comparative Health Effectiveness with Medical and Invasive Approaches trial. This was a study which began in 2012 and it was completed in 2020 and it aimed to determine the most effective treatment strategies for patients with stable coronary artery disease, particularly those with moderate to severe ischemia. Ischemia means a lack of blood getting where it's, need, where it's needed. The primary focus was to compare outcomes between two treatment approaches. An invasive strategy, this involved that you do an angiogram, locate those narrowings and fix them either with a stent or a bypass. Or a conservative strategy, which just involved giving the patient medication pills and not focusing immediately on invasive procedures, stents, etc. So one arm was do whatever you can put stents in, do a bypass, whatever. The other was treat with tablets, lifestyle and regular monitoring. And only move on or only consider bypasses and stents if the patient did not respond uh, in terms of improvement in their symptoms with just medications and lifestyle changes. So the results were very interesting. The results of the ischemia trial are significant for the field of cardiology and change some treatment paradigms for patients with stable coronary artery disease. Now, the thing they were interested in looking at was the primary endpoint, which was a composite of death from any cause, heart attacks, hospitalization for angina, or any other cardiac events. So the study found that a median follow-up of about 3.2 years there was no significant difference between the invasive and conservative treatment strategies in terms of the primary outcome. Both strategies had similar rates of mortality and major cardiovascular events. So in that sense, it did not appear that, the, um, that doing an invasive, appro approaching this inv invasively and doing stents and bypasses without a trial of medical therapy was more beneficial than just trying medical therapy tablets. Now the secondary outcomes, so there were primary outcomes that they were measuring and secondary outcomes. So the overall primary outcome did not show a significant benefit of invasive treatment, but there were some secondary benefits to the invasive strategy. So patients who went underwent bypass or um, stents seemed to report a better control over angina and therefore a better quality of life. And those patients who underwent bypasses and stents seemed to have less hospitalizations for angina compared to the ones who were taking tablets. So in very small uh, subgroups, very high risk features, invasive strategies had a slight advantage, although the difference was not large enough to alter the overall conclusion. So the, the study showed that basically there was no long-term mortality benefit from putting stable patients through bypasses and stents without trying them on medications first. And if, you, if they've responded to medications and if they were angina-free, then it was best just to leave them as they were. So the ischemia trial basically emphasized a more patient-centered approach and concluded that when you have patients, try with tablets first if the symptoms settle down, let it be. 
If, on the other hand, symptoms do not settle down despite tablets, then it may not be unreasonable to consider stents and bypasses. Now, there was some debate about whether, because this was only for 3.2 years, so it may be that, you know, if you followed these patients up for a longer period of time, maybe you would have seen a difference, but we don't have that. But this was one of the biggest studies that has been done to look at this. So the main takeaway message was that if you have stable angina, your symptoms have settled with tablets, there is no mortality benefit from having stents or bypasses. And in fact, the concern is that if you go and have a stent or a bypass, then you're going through the risk of the procedure, etc. So if you can get away with just tablets, then that may be better in terms of overall sort of a quality of life and just general, you know, not having to be go through the indignity of procedures. So this is what this is the data I gave my patient. And after the consultation, the patient felt a lot more comforted and could understand why the nurse had made the decision that she had. He decided that he would go and cut his stress levels down, keep working on a healthy lifestyle, and he promised to come back and see me if at any point that he felt that the angina was getting worse. I also said to him that if you feel that the tablets are giving you side effects and those side effects are unacceptable, then come back and we can talk about it. So I hope this is useful. Many of you, some of you may be going through the same dilemma and um, I hope this is useful to you. I would love to hear your comments. Uh, once again, thank you for all that you do for me. All the best.